we have several topics today that are um, fundamental, and then tomorrow we will have a second version of the same uh, topic, but thinking more about um, more difficult issues on that topic and issues especially related to transfer. Okay. Um, so for environmental data, this will be more about kinds of data and sources of data and more general things to think about. And later will be more, well, which of these make sense uh, or don't for transfer? Okay? And now, uh, I am not Sada Bareva, um, but I did a class with her. Uh, we did a, a workshop in Venezuela a year and a half ago or two years ago. And these are some slides that she put together and then I translated them into the text. Um, and then some of the other things that I will present are things we worked on together. So um, let's think about kinds of variables. Um, so later we'll go into um, more details on climatic variables, which is what most of us use, and then some other kinds of variables that sometimes can be important, but they're usually harder to get. Um, so we need to think, as biologists, what variables do we think uh, plausibly might uh, be determining our species distribution? And lo there's lots of kinds of abiotic variables that uh, people have thought about. Um, all kinds of aspects of climate, uh, aspects of topography, orography, um, and then soils, and especially for some kinds of plants, uh, soils can be really important. Or if you are studying an animal species that depends very strongly on a particular kind of vegetation that itself depends upon the soil, um, one option is to try to uh, have some information directly about the vegetation or um, you could use information about the soils um, because, remember, we are doing correlative models and we don't necessarily have the direct drivers. We're going to talk tomorrow about um, uh, different classifications of variables and how close we are to the driving variable. Um, but, but what we're doing is correlative approaches anyway. Um, and then for some uh, aquatic uh, systems, you have a completely different set of uh, relevant variables, and um, Chris will talk later about variables for the marine environment, but if you're doing aquatic you know, species on the terrestrial environment, then obviously you need to think about different kinds of variables than you would for a, um, a terrestrial plant uh, that grows on dry soil, or a mammal that lives in a forest. Um, and then, for some species, um, there can be uh, information about the air that can be useful. And uh, that it depends upon uh, you know, whether you think there are particular metabolic stresses, for example, carbon dioxide is a uh, concentration along an elevation gradient. If you have high elevation species, that kind of thing can be important. Or for some plants, um, these kind of things can be important. Then, of course, we have biotic variables. Um, so this is a definitely an area um, on the frontier. So the past two years there's been an explosion of papers somehow integrating biotic variables with predictors. And um, it's a really interesting time, um, but for systems where we know that that's important, then um, it's worth thinking about, is there a way I can include a, uh, a biotic variable as a good predictor uh, for my species? Um, for example, I'm working with some people who are doing uh, butterfly work, and but the butterfly only uh, can develop, its uh, larva only can develop on the leaves of oak trees in the Pacific Coast. And so there are places where it could, the butterfly can physiologically go to colder places, but the oak can't. So the butterfly is limited by that. Um, so know your system. Um, and, and then, uh, of course, um, we need to remember human impacts. And so some people are making models based on uh, more general abiotic variables and then cutting them by removing areas that have been too altered by humans. It's what we call, call a cookie cutter approach. Um, you also uh, can use remotely sensed data as an environmental predictor. But what is really critical in that case is making sure you have temporal correspondence between uh, the environmental data and the current state that you use. So 
because if you have museum data, for example, with the mammals that work on in South America, to get a big enough sample size, you usually have to go back and use all the museum data from the 1920s or even before. But the species could have been uh, caught uh, very often in forests that, uh, that now are a banana plantation. So if we have satellite imagery that says that's a banana plantation, which the species can't uh, exist in, it's not going to be helpful for us at all. Okay? And there are ways to trick models into using, say, climate data for a long term and then uh, only using the satellite data for your recent record. Um, but those are, you, you can trick the algorithm into doing that. Uh, and that's fine, but you, you have to work harder at it. You have to think about that. Question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, climate. This is really what most of us are using. And um, most of it is interpolated from weather stations, but some um, are based on physical models of circulation that then are, are parameterized and calibrated from real data. And world plan is probably a friend of many of yours, right? Okay. Um, another data set um, that I think is definitely worth looking at is um, called Climon. Uh, Criticos is the first author of that paper. Um, depending on what region of the world, there may be better data sets. For the United States, there's something called PRISM. Um, Mexico has a, a much better um, system or a better data, for example, that are interpolated. Um, Stations. Uh, so in your region, you may have a better uh, data set. But if you're crossing countries, if you're crossing continents, um, world plan is you know pretty easy to use, right? Now, there's some things that we need to keep straight. One is world plan is a particular data set, just like Climon is a data set, and it has monthly data, right? That then they process through some scripts to get what are called bioclimatic variables. Um, and these bioclimatic variables are derived variables that tell us something that we hope will be more informative about actually what affects our species. Like the temperature of the wettest month, like the temperature of the hottest month, or the precipitation of the driest month, or the precipitation of the wettest quarter. So any three contiguous months um, that together form the wettest or the driest season. Um, and those should be more, um, more directly informative uh, for us and, and are likely to transfer better. We'll see that uh, these, some of these principles tomorrow. But think about this. If we have the January temperature, if we were just to use months, January temperature of New York, right? And think about the January temperature of the Pacific. Is that the same limiting factor? No? So it might be limiting a species in New York, uh, but if it's limiting a species in Winnipeg, it's limiting because it's too hot, right? Not because it's too cold. So rather than the temperature of a particular month, we should use the temperature of the hottest month and then figure out for each place what is the hottest month and what's the temperature there. Another variable is the temperature of the coldest month. Figure out which uh, month that is. So those kinds of uh, derived variables should be better for predicting our species and um, should be better for transfer. Okay. So we, you notice um, that when they made World Plan, they got a lot of data from, from Turkey, from Italy, from the US, from Mexico, uh, from parts of the Andes, and so on. But there are places that they don't have much. And it varies according to the variable. This one is for temperature range. This is precipitation. And uh, they use some interpolation techniques, spatial interpolation techniques, to fill in the gaps. And um, the particular algorithm with Andy's plan, which takes uh, elevation into account in the total area. And let's think about uh, ways that you can interpolate. So this is to kind of get a window into the possible quality of the data that we're almost all using. How many people have made a model using some world plan data? World plan data. Uh -huh. How many people have 
have made a model, right? But you never, ever, ever have used Wolfram. Okay. Um, marine environment, right? And okay. So what region? Okay. So you have some. What? What? Where did you get your data from? Okay. Yes. Okay. So very specific local thing, probably that one for you, right? Um, but most of us are using um, this, this or something like this. So let's think a bit about what are some of the possible issues. And um, the current version doesn't have any error services. Uh, who issues critical? Does anybody know that Climax does? Do they provide any uncertainty or error services? So, I don't think so. Yeah. So, the resolution is a bit high. Okay. So, um, the next generation of these uh, products, um, and I forget if there's another world print in the, in, the, in the works, are going to provide not only the best estimate, but also a variable, uh, you know, a surface that tells you um, how much error they think there could be in that pixel. Okay, because there's some areas that, you know, you have a, a weather station, weather station, weather station, weather, weather station, and this looks like a pretty, pretty easy place to interpret it, right? But if you have really wide ones and you have a lot of topographic <coughs> maybe, then over here it may be, you know, really uncertain. And so that um, will help us. And one thing throughout the whole process is the field is moving toward quantifying uncertainty in our predictions. And there are many stages that, of the process where uh, error can come in and uncertainty just exists, right? Um, so be on the lookout in the literature for papers that are coming out from several groups about how to quantify uh, error and how to um, say how much of that uncertainty is due to a particular stage of the process. So if we have any points, we have to uh, interpolate them some, uh, a few pages and things off of Wikipedia. Um, so Mary's neighbor interpolation is very simple. You for any uh, value of the, of the variable, you are just seeing uh, which actual known data point is closest. A linear is uh, like when you're a little kid and you connect the dots on the little, <coughs> the little drawing. Uh, polynomials are uh, smoother and more complex. And splines are uh, also smooth and And, but this is what, uh, you know, it's home with me. You can see here, you know, how simple this kind of thing is, how this is probably more realistic, and this, um, you know, may or may not be more realistic for this system. But it gives you an idea of what, what the geographers do, right? Um, with temperature data, um, this is the distribution of points that have been used for WorldClim. And she's given this again to show the, um, the gaps. Precipitation rather different. And then we look at what comes out in these beautiful maps. But as I said, um, these are variable in their, uh, in their uncertainty and that it's unquantified. OK, so these are the 19 biochromatic variables that WorldClim has um, included. And if you take monthly data, you can run it through scripts and you can get these derived variables that hopefully are more informative and uh, will transfer to other regions, right? Rather than our January temperature example. Okay? Um, there are more biochromatic variables um, that are, um, for example, um, implemented in uh, climate. Um, another thing to keep straight is, so bio 16, bio 9, these are what people call biochromatic variables, which are actually, you know, uh, they were defined quite a while back. That, and they were used in a technique called bioclim, right? We're going to do some very simple uh, bioclim things this afternoon as uh, a way to think about geographic spaces and environmental spaces. But using bioclimatic variables for bioclim is one thing, but you can use these bioclimatic variables for any other algorithm you want to, right? Or you could take other variables, you could take um, some remotely sensed variable and put it through the algorithm bioclim. 
but people people kind of get confused with that. Okay? BioClean is just a very, very simple technique that basically um, it implements Hutchinson's multi-dimensional uh, concept of the image. Okay? 